Well, let, let me start by welcoming uh, you, Steve Heller, to the Bibliophile. Glad to be here. We're going to be talking about a book that you wrote with Seymour Quast back in 1995 called Jackets Required, an illustrated history of American book jacket design from 1920 to 1950. And so back in 1995, you were the senior art director at the New York Times and the editor of the AIGA Journal of Graphic Design. You were the author of over 30 books, including Designing for Children and Innovators of American Illustration with Louise Philly. You authored Italian Art Deco Graphic Design Between the Wars and Dutch Modern Graphic Design from De Still to Deco, both published by Chronicle Books. Perhaps you could bring us up to speed. Well, since then, I've done over 190 books. That's almost unbelievable. I'm not calling you a f- fake news no, deliverer, no, it's, but... it's unfortunately a reality. I'm no longer at the Times. I was the art director for the book review for 30 years. I wrote the visuals column for the New York Times book review. I wrote obituaries for the New York Times. I've written for other major magazines, and I am the co-chair of the School of Visual Arts MFA Design Designer as Entrepreneur program, where we are right now. And then there are other tidbits along the way. I like Designer as Entrepreneur because that kind of captures the essence of a book jacket being both uh, commercial and uh, artistic? Well, entrepreneur for me is creating content and whatever platform that content inhabits, it doesn't matter as long as it's something that is self-generated and goes out into the world. So Michelangelo was an entrepreneur then? You could say, yeah. Uh, Although he did have his patrons. He didn't Uh, finish too much either. Right. And some patrons tend to be like clients today. But as far as books go and book jackets, doing a book, doing books in general is what I felt made me an entrepreneur. Some of them I produced myself. Most of them I worked with others to package for publishers. So it was never like I owned a publishing house, but I did generate content of my own and of my colleagues. Content meaning dust jackets? Content meaning an entire book. Okay. The dust jacket is just the wrapping or the advertising or the promotion uh, or the gift gift The most important thing, isn't it, to sell the book? I would say it is an important way of selling the book. And it was that in the 20s, 30s, 40s. But with television, with radio, and certainly now with social media, it is not anywhere near the most important thing. The most important thing is hearing the author talking about the book. I like, I like to hear that because of my podcast. But it's also word of mouth. That's it's also word of mouth. But I get one book a week from Amazon. It's kind of like the Book of the Month Club or the Book of the Week Club. And it's usually because I hear it on some radio show. I'm reading now uh, Salman Rushdie's latest novel. And it was because he was on Bill Maher. Yeah. And I had never read Rushdie before, so I thought I'd give it a shot. The week before, I read a book called Invisible Hands, which was about how the business community in America destroyed the New Deal. And I bought that simply because I heard a little snippet on on the media on NPR. So I didn't even know what those books looked like until they showed up. It just so happens that Rushdie's cover doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. And Invisible Hand doesn't appeal to me. So it used to be I'd pick up books based on the beauty of the cover. My wife was a book cover designer at Pantheon for many years and did well over 2,000 book jackets and covers. But, you know, now they're kind of a, uh, a luxury. 
It's interesting because um, during the period that uh, this book covers, 1920 to 50, it seemed like point of sale was was really important. Point of sale was extremely important in almost any retail operation. A lot of those books that had interesting covers were put out, spine out on a shelf. Yeah. So there was still word of mouth that was necessary but you know you see photographs as we have in there of books on counters and it's like Barnes and Noble today uh, you have to be attracted in some fashion and even though you're bombarded now with all this media sometimes it is just an impulse buy well and that's it that's uh, as I say I guess you measure the effectiveness of the dust jacket not by how pretty it is, but by how many books it sells. Ultimately, that's the marketer's trope. Those of us who love book jackets for their aesthetic pleasures are usually disappointed by the marketer's trope. <laughs> and those of us who make books and work with the designers on those books are usually disappointed by marketers who will accept book jackets that aren't quite up to certainly my standard and other standards as well. What is your standard? My standard is I want to look at something that I feel proud of either having done or own, something that is either typographically or illustratively enticing enticing what? You want to own it? I want to own it. I want to look at it. You want to spend time with it? Yeah, it's like a poster, mini poster. I collect posters just as I collect certain book jackets that went into this book yeah. so long ago. I love this book. It's timeless, this book. I think that's the other thing for me anyway. Uh, I mean, we'll get into this, but the... the uh, the, the person who, the artist who designs this cover has a shot at immortality here because books don't, well, many books don't disappear. They stay with us for centuries. They do, but the interesting thing is the book jacket was always an appendage. Mm -hmm. It was rarely done by the person who designed the book. It was sneered at. And it was taken off. Yeah. You know, one of the resources for book jackets that... I had was the Library of Congress where only the book jacket was sent. The book went to another part of the library. Right. So there are some that are iconic like E. McKnight Cowfer's version of uh, Ulysses. Mm -hmm. uh, there the were, Big U. The Big U. There were many editions of Ulysses including one by Ernst Reichel. Uh, which was the first, and is an interesting one to look at, but the one that remains in memory is the uh, Kaufer. You've got them both in the book, by the way. Yeah. I really like the... Uh, <laughs> I did read the book, and I spent a fair amount of time uh, ogling and, uh, and just enjoying all of the wonderful color images, but uh, you, you capture quite a bit in this little uh, dust jacket flap. Uh, for example, uh, your first sentence is at once seductive, informative, and ephemeral. A book jacket is designed to evoke and promote the contents of a book. So how is it seductive? Well, seduction is part of allure. And mm -hmm. anything that is advertising should have allure. But explain that then. What's allure? Allure is that force that drags you into what you're looking at, that appeals to you, that gives you a certain pleasure, visceral pleasure, intellectual pleasure. That it's, makes you want to own it. Makes you want to be with it. Whether you own it or not is another story. You know, as you get older, owning things is less important than having things. Well, especially when you've run out of space. Exactly. Which I have. And I have too. Okay, so how... I mean, obviously we know that the dust jacket provides you with typically the name of the uh, author and the name of the book itself, but how else is it informative? Well, 
It's informative in that it gives you the sense of the book, hopefully. It tells you a little tale about the book. How would it do that? Well, the use of images, the use of symbols. If, if it's a book on World War II, there are so many books now that are spy books uh, that I read of mm. World War II, and the covers are very evocative. They're not full of swastikas. They're not full of fighting men. They're not heavy-handed, ham-fisted. There's a kind of subtlety that makes me feel like this book is not just going to be a book by the numbers, you know, where every little cliche is going to be articulated. There's something else. There's a mood. Like a mood of what? Of fear? Of uh... It doesn't matter. It's whatever the mood, whatever you interpret. I mean, okay. these things are Rorschach tests. And each of us has different triggers. And each of us has different triggers. So I, I suppose they want to trigger as many people. As many people as they can. Yeah, I mean, science fiction as a genre, you, you can tell what they are, but not all science fiction books have the same kind of genre, genre tropes. When I look at a book that's being done for me, I want to have something that, whether it tells the content of the book or not, I want something that, that expresses my own pride in what I've done. And these are questions that can't be answered in specific. They're emotional. You're talking from the perspective of, of the perspective of the author or the publisher. The author or the publisher, yeah. Right. So you want it, you want to be proud of it, but what? You also want it to express that pride. If it can. How does it do that? Just by being it. So you can you know, the, show it off. The you, problem. You want to be able to show it off. I want to be able to as I'm passing it, if it's in Barnes & Noble, say that's mine and I'm happy with it. Yeah. There have been book covers that, and jackets that have graced my books that I'm not too happy with. Okay. And, you know, uh, they're just as well on the shelf than spine out than face out. So the, the, the publisher wants it to be beautiful, evocative, mood-provoking, and sell. And sell. So... Are there any sort of constants over the last hundred years that uh, guarantee sales, or is that too? Silly? I don't think there's anything that guarantees sales. I think if you have a best-selling author, the constant is you make the author's name larger than the title. Yeah, uh, that's what's called the big book look. Uh, it's funny. There's a Canadian historian, a, writer, a popular history writer, Pierre Burton. He's dead now, but. I, I never forget the book. There's a, there's a book that has, it's pretty well, the entire cover is his name. Right. Well, you know, that's what s sells for many people. What also might sell is war, love. And if you look at Harlequin romances, it's that sexy macho dude and the uh, pulpish looking damsel. Uh, Cleavage? Cleavage helps. Used to be you put a swastika on a book and that would sell. Post? Um, post war? Post war, yeah. Okay. Because that indicated that it was a uh, either a battle book or a, uh, an espionage book. Uh, so I think there are different things that happened. My, my wife. What's her name? Louise Feely. Okay. She created a book that changed the way book jackets were designed in the, in the 90s. You're not she, saying that just because she's your wife? No, I'm, that's, I'm saying that is why I met her. That's why you married her? It could be, but it's also why I met her. The book was The Lover by Marguerite Dura. And translated? It was a translated book, mm -hmm. yes. But what she did, instead of just putting that big book look down, nobody here really knew who Marguerite Dura was. The title was called The Lover, and she took this silhouetted face of Dura as a young woman and put it against a cream background. And the type was slightly dimensional. And that book won tons of awards and helped make a basically unknown author into a literary star and sold a lot of books at the same time. So 
it meant that the, the prescription for book sales all of a sudden changed a bit. You know, instead of taking two pills with water, this was four pills with uh, chocolate milk. I don't understand. Like, why is this such a significant book? It's a significant. Well, the book is the significant. The design, I mean. The design is significant because it was nuanced. It was low key. It wasn't smacking you in the face. And that's new. That was new then. I'm sure there's lots of people that would argue with you about that. Maybe, but I'd argue back. I wish I could have a look at the uh, book so I could argue with you. Well, you'll find it on. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we could meet again and have an argument about it. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened was after that there became a new era of book design, where uh, sure there were some re relationships to books of the past, like Alvin Lustig. His book jackets were very nuanced and low key, but they weren't. It's like a little psych psychological, psychedelic. Well, maybe not psychedelic, psychological. Those they things. were they were heady and typographically simple, just as the modernists, like Paul Rand, were doing a different kind of book jacket than the ones that came in the '40s or '30s. Sure. Uh, and this lover marked another one of those paradigmatic shifts and then that kind of went on for a while and then someone like Chip Kidd comes along uh, these are all kind of arcane distinctions right. uh, because you have to be a real book jacket nerd to yeah. see but you, them you, you have to, as you say you have to have to have seen a shitload of them before you can say something like that right but since I I'm supposedly a historian of graphic design. I can say it and be <laughs> certain that I'm right. And that's why I'm talking to you. Even though I'm full of uncertainty. That's the best way to be. Doubt too, right? Oh, doubt, yes. Love doubt. Yeah. During the 20s, 30s, and 40s, book jackets emerged as one of America's most vital graphic media. Why is that? Well, because, again, I said so. Uh, the other answer to that, a little less facetious, <laughs> is that books were one of the limited amount of media that we were exposed, exposed, to, exposed yeah. to as a sure. public. So there were movie posters. Yeah. There were record albums starting in the late 30s, thanks to Alex Steinweiss, who was the first record album designer to put original art on records. And you collected a ton of those too, I imagine. Well, I, I wrote in a big book on, on his work, and I knew him, and I kind of helped resurrect his reputation. That's a wonderful thing to do. It is, I mean, it happened, he could, he was alive for about 20 years before he he got he got it he got it he got it back thanks in part to you in part yeah but thanks mostly to him being who he was right but um you know so so if you were a reader you know you, there were also newspapers and there were also magazines and the visual stimulation of the of those years of those decades was really much more limited. It was also a period of depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So certain books did the same job that certain movies did. Right. And free libraries were a little more prevalent. So you're saying America's most vital graphic media, but perhaps what you're also, you're also suggesting is the most uh, prevalent. Yeah, I mean, vital is a word that I kind of throw around. Words mean something, but for me, vital meant that there were a number of artists who were doing book jackets, getting paid crap Pete. for them, Yeah, uh, but were able to explore their own visual range. The marketing departments were 
still there, but they weren't as uh, tight-assed as they became. So some designers could get away with having a visual signature or a visual style uh, on their covers. And, and also, there were many designers who could actually sign their covers. I was going to say, actually, in, in the book, uh, I mean, sure, there are quite a few that are signed, but there's a ton of them that aren't signed, too, which... Uh, I and think, they may get a credit line or they may not. Yeah, which I imagine various associations and guilds have worked to try and get recognition for their members. Well, there was one that started, I think, in 1948, the yeah. Book Jacket Guild. Mm. That was really the uh, first. Before that, there were the art directors' clubs and things like that that tried to get recognition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it was at the beneficence of the publisher. Random House, of course, always used to put a colophon in their book that told who the book designer was and what typeface was used and where that typeface came from. Yeah, you talk about uh, the fact that the Dust Jackets showcased the talent of America's most exci- exciting illustrators and designers. And is that because it would paint peanuts so lots of young, excited, new talent sort of was used for yeah, it? Yeah, that was part of it. What was Certainly the other a part? Large then? part of it. The other part is that graphic design was called commercial art, was uh, a profession where you took the jobs where you could. Right. So if somebody was offered a book jacket and you know they got $150 for it or $75 for it, they took it. Yeah. And some people did work that, you know, was below what they had done for other media and others used it as an opportunity to go further well you get a big bestseller on your hands and it gets your work into the houses of millions of Americans yeah also in the 20s and 30s the many bestsellers were used as the basis for movies so to my knowledge, there weren't that many book jackets that transferred into movie titles. No. But certainly by or the... Or movie posters. Or movie posters. Definitely not movie posters. Yeah. Uh, but at some point in the 60s, 70s, book jackets were being transferred onto the screen or onto the posters representing that screen. Godfather being a biggie. The book then uh, traces the <clears throat> traces the evolution of the book jacket during this period, uh, and it coincided with uh, the Art Deco era and the commercialization of modern art as a universal graphic style. The book jackets were inspired by the European art movements. Maybe we could just quickly go through those. Futurism, what's that? Well, futurism was an Italian phenomenon which, like many of the early modern design and art periods, was attacking the more established, they were anti-bourgeois, they were trying to show that literalism was not the be-all and end-all. The futurists were a revolutionary movement that wanted to change language of all kind and make it more machine-age friendly. Uh, More efficient? Not more efficient, but the machine was becoming a major part of our lives and they wanted to represent that in paint and in sculpture and in graphics. And it also, the futurists coincided with the fascist revolution. Right. So they were kind of the artistic arm of fascism, at least in the early days when fascism was a kind of could never call it progressive, mm. but it was revolutionary. And it was appealing to a lot of people. And appealed to a yeah. lot of people. So what, Dadaism was uh, just too, too much over the top for No, Dada and Futurism were the same, but you know, the, the jackets that were being done from those movements uh, were not going to be mainstream in any way. Yeah. It was just... I did a, a book called From Mares to Emigre and Beyond, and it was a story about avant-garde magazines of the 20th century. 
So magazines also fit into that. But these were all things that were on the fringes. Uh, mass market books and ultimately paperbacks like Liver Wright and Boney produced a lot of paperbacks. Mm. These were all things that still were rooted in the traditions that were established in yeah. the bookstores. And every so often you'd see somebody breaking out of that tight tradition. And so you'd see a cover that had a cubist kind of sensibility or a cover that had an expressionistic sensibility. So that's where the fine arts come into designers' work. But I guess there are limits. You, you don't want to freak out the consumer. You want, to, you want to sell to the consumer, so you can't go wild. Well, that's where an editor would say, you can't go wild. And an artist would say, well, either I do what I do or bye-bye. And that happened a lot. Yeah, I guess 75 bucks wasn't that difficult to walk away from. No. Or they just did something that was totally unlike what they did as, as their expressive art. But, you know, if, when you look through Jackets Required, mm. the books we found all had some sort of personality to them. There were a few that were comic book-like. There were a few that were dealing with generalities. You know, some of the romance books had the ideal, the platonic person of that, that day. You saw very rarely anything that related to African Americans. If you looked at a book about cowboys and Indians, it was usually the cliched Indian. We left out an awful lot of books that we just thought were trite, uh, but put in a few that where the designer had a little bit of extra touch. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was with the typeface. Maybe it was with the way something was drawn. Like there was Paul Collin and Jean Carlou. These were French poster artists, and they did book jackets as well. And their book jackets were done very much like their posters. One that I remember, I forget by which one of those artists, it was about ar rearmament. And so there are these two huge cannon coming out of a battleship. But they made a beautiful design, and they were done in airbrush. And, uh, you know, just cropping in closely on these things made for a powerful piece of graphic art. And at the same time, you knew what it, the book was about. Bauhaus. Well, the Bauhaus was about realigning all forms of design, reducing all ornament to very simple uh, forms, squares, circles, triangles. Uh, reducing color to one or two, red and black. Uh, reducing type to sans serif, flush left, rag right. Um, so Helvetica comes out of that? Helvetica or? came out of that much later yeah. in the 50s. Bauhaus books, while they're treasured today, were not part of the mainstream. By the th late 30s, 40s, you found people who were influenced by the Bauhaus that were doing Bauhausian things you know, photo montage, let's say. But you, you won't find the best seller done by the Bauhaus. Der Stil. Der Stil was yet another reaction to uh, tradition. Uh, it reduced art. Mondrian was one. Theo van Duisburg was another. It reduced the art to uh, abstract form, but based on a grid. So it was very geometric. Mm -hmm. Colors were primary. It is said that Mondrian left the De Stiel movement in Holland because uh, Theo van Duisburg wanted to include the color green. <laughs> and then that would piss me off. Mondrian too. just wanted red, yellow, blue, <laughs> and black. <laughs> so do you admire that? I admire anybody that stands up to the rules then I have to look at what they're doing it for, and then I'll make another judgment. Uh, constructivism, finally. Well, Russian constructivism was a kind of a elaboration of all the things we've talked about. The Soviet Union at the time of Russian constructivism, which again was about abstraction, it was about revolting against 
a more academic order. They had shortages of ink, paper, type, so they had to make do and they created a visual language that used typecase materials, things from letterpress that they made into abstract designs. And, and this sounds again like uh, a little bit like Because I Said So. Uh, you finish it off with, as well as by artifacts garnered from antiquity. That to me just comes right out of left field. I, I'm not sure what the context is. It's, uh, it's in the same context as all of these different movements. Well, I think there were, in modern design, uh, many of the designers were in a weird way classicists. You know, there's the difference between tradition and classicism. Okay. Tradition can be somebody created a rule and stylistically other people followed it and drove it into the ground. Mm -hmm. Classicism, you go back and you can't argue with it. Yeah, you stay there. For its beauty, for its aesthetic primacy, whatever you want to call it. So in many of the jackets that I've collected since mm -hmm. and then, you know, there were certain artifacts from classic Rome, or Greece, or that were used in a modern context. That reminds me of uh, Paul Rand, big time. Because I just picked up, uh, well, I'm just looking at, for example, his Leave Cancelled. Leave Cancelled was a great book, and he took a, a, a Cupid, silhouetted it, put it against a pink lavender background, shot a couple of bullet holes through it, which increased the price of the book, the retail book, by a few pennies, and took an unknown author and made a terrific mm -hmm. representation of this very sad story of a man who marries a woman while he's on leave uh, from World War I, and his leave is canceled, hence the title, and mm -hmm. he goes back to the war and dies. Yeah, Cupid is shot down. Yeah, the one I actually bought, I, I picked this up at a cool little bookstore in Chicago. The Law. The Law, yeah. Yeah, and The Law is also taking, you know, the, the famous statue of the law cropping in on his, on God's face mm. uh, and covering the type with it. it it's, it's a simple concept. Uh, that makes for a strong cover jacket. The name of that bookstore was the Armadillo's Pillow. <laughs> okay, so we've done a bit of the evolution. Do, is there anything else that's sort of uh, significant that should be said about how uh, dust jackets were affected by artistic movements? Okay. Um, yeah, we, we touched a bit on best practices, but uh, do you have any thoughts on best practices when designing book, book jackets? To be honest, no. I mean, we always talk in school about what best practices are, and I, uh, you know, usually say the obvious. And the obvious is don't make something that's going to be too abstruse, mm -hmm. but you can make something that's abstract. I think rather than best practices, there's something called taste, and taste changes over time. And I did a book, I did a, a biography of Paul Rand where I show his covers, his jackets. I did a biography of Alvin Lustig where I show his covers and jackets, and in both cases I adore them. Uh, some are better than others, but I, I really love the the ability to use abstract form as illustration or as signal. But I also did a book called The Moderns, and The Moderns was a book of work that originally I did not care for because it was very reductive, very geometric, very shall we say, scientific, 
without the kind of soul that I found in earlier work like Dada or Expressionism. And one of the book designers, or book, one of the designers in there who also did books, paperback books, was a man named Rudy Deharic. And he worked almost exclusively with geometries and maybe one or two typefaces all the time. And I found that very limiting at first. And then I got to looking at his work more and more and more and found that there were a lot of dissimilarities within his similar umbrella mm. or format. Mm -hmm. And I learned to appreciate work that I hadn't appreciated when I was younger and more closed of mind. You know, so he's working within limits. He was working within his limits. He defined right. his own language. Uh, you know, there are many people who will read a book or read the synopsis, because rarely do they read books, and come up with an appropriate image or typographic rendering to express that book's content. Sometimes there are designers that will just throw whatever they have on the page. But other times there is a different process of interpretation. And the interpretation is more abstract because that's the way they see and that's the way they produce other things that they're doing. So there's a wide range of best practices. Yeah. And, and it's seen uh, within the work of best practitioners, as you say, how, how sort of diverse the jackets are on books that sell well. So if it was easy to come up with a formula, everyone would follow it. Right. And also, there are different kinds of books. Well, each the, one is pretty well individual, isn't it? It needs its own marketing strategy. It needs its own strategy, but even the same book, as mm -hmm. we were talking about Ulysses, there have been at least four versions of Ulysses. You know, logic tells you that if a book sold well with one cover, why should there be another cover? Why should the paperback be different from the hardcover? Mm -hmm. And those are all things that are just made up in the marketing room. Well, they want to appeal to a new generation of readers. They want to appeal to a new generation of readers. But, you know, for example, I picked up and reread uh, Catcher in the Rye recently. Terrible. Edition that I went up it is. I, I thought it awful. sucked. I know. I don't remember. I can't remember why it was so terrific or why it's still thought of as terrific, but that's another story. But the edition that I remember was the red cover and the yellow type, typography, which was Times or something. And this one is has this drawing on it of a carousel horse, which comes out of a very minor part of the book. Mm. So they're trying to appeal to a younger audience with the older jacket. Hmm. And so it, it's not always that something new will breed something novel. You're particularly uh, keen on uh, lettering and typography. Well, that's what graphic design is. It's lettering, typography, and image put together into a composition that becomes a whole unit. And particularly so, obviously, with, with dust jackets. has to be. Yeah. Unfortunately, with some dust jackets, you have to throw a type on that a designer would prefer not to have, like a blurb. Yeah. Or from the author of, which is, you know, puts it back into the advertising department. What about calligraphy, knowledge of calligraphy? Well, there are a lot of calligraphic books book covers and jackets mm. and that was very prevalent in the late 40s 50s and I've never been a fan of that I think of Dwiggins when I Dwiggins was more than calligraphic but it's very it's got that feel to it he uses words in a very sort of quite a flourish well most of his calligraphic work is on the spines but there are jackets that he's done which he didn't like he was not a fan of his own jackets, although mm. I am. Mm. He used ornament a lot, and he used hand lettering. Hand lettering is not calligraphy. Calligraphy okay. is scripts. Hand lettering is what? Each separate letter? More or less. If the letter has swashes or something, there needs to be a connection. But there is a difference between hand lettering and calligraphy. Calligraphy is much more 
artful. One of the things that uh, I think I think of Chip Kid and a number of other designers, there's the choice of being literal in your images. There's there's also uh, being metaphorical and intriguing and re- demanding of the viewer that blanks be filled in, like it's almost like a visual puzzle. Mm-hmm. It seems like there's quite a bit of that there's going on. That- started in the late 60s, 70s, a lot in the 80s and 90s. You know, and Paul Rand did that as well. There are book jackets that he did that you really do have to fill in the blanks. And that's what good design is. It's not giving you everything on a silver platter. Logos do the same thing. And a book jacket, you know, is a kind of superannuated logo. One of the things we're doing right now uh, is is really talking like collectors, and uh, you can't really collect blogs. I just wonder how collecting has uh, informed your practice as a teacher and a scholar and a student. Well, collecting is just accumulating raw material, and that becomes the basis for your history. And so it's also the basis for teaching. And writing about those collections have become very important. How do you describe them? How do you contextualize them? Uh, How do you compare them to other people, places, and things? Uh, It's also fun as hell. It's fun until it becomes obsessive. And most collectors I know become obsessive Mm. and then protect, they protect their work uh, what do you mean their work? Their work being the collection. The okay. collection becomes a raison d'etre. I've been the obsessive collector and I've kind of worked my way out of it, out of necessity. Through 12 steps? More or less, 12 steps of selling. Who you sold with? Well, I've sold to dealers. I've sold, I had three sales just for anybody who wanted to come off the street to another building of SVA. I had tons of stuff for sale. You just said, what? Well, we advertised three sales, you know, like a flea market. How'd that feel? It felt weird. But at the same time, it felt liberating. So you're not really driven to, when you were thinking about new things, you're not driven to, uh, to go out and get them now so much? No, I still will buy things if something looks to me like I should have it. Uh, but I'm not driven, you know, I'll go to a book fair and I won't buy everything that strikes my fancy. I'll usually get something that I will make a book out of. Yeah. But but there are people who collect to create history so that their collection will be encased in a museum or a library or right. whatever, you know, or it's an investment. Yeah, you know we can't ignore that. That's pretty dodgy. Most collectors they collect do for money. They they hope that's that's a big uh, that's a big problem. I well, think. it's a big if because what you think is valuable and what you've paid a lot of money for, the same person who sold it to you won't think it's as valuable until he sells it again. And when you want to sell it, if you want to, you you have to be able to convince others of its value. Yeah, and usually that doesn't work. Unless it's a very extensive collection and it goes to an institution. You know, Glenn Horowitz has sold the Dillon collection for $50 $50 million. million. Yeah. So, you know, there are certain people whose collections are worth that simply because they're historically important. Well, and he created much of it. Dillon did. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of ironic you talk about the dust track as being ephemeral and... 70% 70% of the value of a book is in a dust jacket. 70% days. is, and I, I had, because I was working on an essay about E. McNaught Koffer, I wanted to get his Green Mansions, which mm-hmm. he did for the new modern library. Yeah. And I went online and I found a copy with the dust jacket. And I ordered it and it went through Amazon. And then I get the book two weeks later and there's no dust jacket on it. Right. Basically, I threw out the book. 
but you know, dust jackets, it's all part of talk to 10 people out on the street and nobody will give a damn. Yeah, well that's part of the mission that I'm on, to try and cultivate a, a collecting culture just because of some of the things you've said and how important it is to scholarship and uh, just understanding the past. Just winding down here, perhaps we could look at some of these best practitioners. You mentioned Mike Coffer. You have a little thumbnail on uh, on his work. Well, McKnight Cowfer, E. McKnight Cowfer, Edward McKnight Cowfer, known as Ted, was best known as a poster artist. Mm -hmm. And he was best known as a poster artist in England. There was a flight of birds. That, yeah, that was his major piece. That was a piece of art that became a poster. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he worked in a variety of styles. Some of them were moder modern, some of them were modern, some of them were abstract. He did jackets for different companies in England because he was a popular cre creator. And when he came to the United States, he did the New Modern Library, among mm. other things. Yeah. And some of those jackets are lovely, and some of those jackets look like he just dashed them off. So, yeah, some of them are terrible. They're like Harlequin kind of. Yeah, so I wouldn't really call him one of the jacket leaders. Who would you call that? Uh, well, I would say that Alvin Lustig was, was really best known for his book jackets. He did New Directions, all based on his love of modern art, of Rothko and the abstract expressionists. And he created a look, a brand for New Directions. And then he changed his course, you know, for for Meridian books or whatever. He took chances with books. He he did photo montage for some of his books. His books were never bestsellers. Lustig died awfully young, didn't he? He was forty five, yeah. Yeah. He had diabetes. Rand did a whole variety of, of covers, but always with the modern artists in his mind, you know, do something that was not part of the mainstream, not part of the the box that people were put in. Saul Bass, who was known for his movie Movies. titles yeah. and advertising and logos, mm -hmm. he did book jackets. Ben Sean did book jackets or covers, often for friends of his, like S.J. Perlman. That included hand lettering and his unique drawing style. Leo Leone, uh, who was art director of Fortune and later on became a children's book, a very popular children's book illustrator, did uh, for vintage books, Look, The Stranger. I own the original of that. and mm. You know, I remember reading it as a kid in high school around the corner here, or junior high school. There are a handful. George Salter, yeah. who was a book jacket designer in Germany before he emigrated here. And he was one of those who used calligraphy as the basis for his work. Yeah, in fact, at the end of the book, uh, you you uh, reserve pages for, for all of these. Uh, uh, Arthur Hawkins, too. Arthur Hawkins was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I remember seeing him at a um, art director's club event. He was quite old, and he was the MC, and I thought, what an old fogey. And I didn't know his work, and then I found his work, and he was gone by then. I'd been in touch with his son years ago, uh, but, you know, he was terrific. There was a guy named Pulitzer, who I yes. know nothing about. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that, because I, I, I remember looking at in the book here, and this might be an error, because it's, his name is right on the jacket, and yet you, you call that particular jacket unknown. Could have been an error. I don't want to end on that, though. Uh, yeah, here it is. It's the Edward Bernays book, Pro yeah, which Propaganda. Is, which is funny. I don't know why that we would have missed that. Yeah, particularly it's very bold. Because isn't it? Edward Bernays' Propaganda book, which has been reprinted and recovered, yeah. uh, this is one I use all the time in lectures on the whole idea of propaganda. So, he, uh, Mr. Pulitzer, wherever you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> He was Freud's nephew. Yeah, Edward yeah. Bernays was. Yeah. yeah. And just finally then, right at the beginning you mentioned that uh, you didn't think that uh, book jackets were uh, anywhere near as important uh, today as uh, 
as they were uh, back, uh, say, 50, 50 years ago. I'll take that back. I'll take that back to say that the importance has changed. That 50, 60 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you went into a bookstore and you browsed. Now you go online and you barely see the jacket yeah. because you've learned about what the book is or at least you're, you've heard about the book, either through the book reviews or, the content, or yeah. fresh air or you know, yeah. something Or the bibliophile. Or... Right. So it's not as big a selling tool as it was, but it's still important to the publishers yeah. and to the marketers. The marketers who, the salesmen who have to go out with the line of books and say to what's becoming fewer and fewer small booksellers, this is what you should buy. Presenting or, it to the buyers. Right. Yeah, yeah. Or to Barnes & Noble, which is shrinking. It's shrinking, but James Daunt is taking over, so watch out. Well, it may revive, but you know, we have Rizzoli, which I still go into and browse, and I'll browse their jackets. Yeah. And uh, but m most of the big chains are gone. But publishers, you know, I still do a few books a year, and the publishers will always, you know, they'll either accept the book jacket that I like, or they'll give me a pain, a hard time over it because they feel that maybe the title isn't as explicit as it should be, or th the keywords that go into Google search are not there. So. The jacket may support the keywords, or whatever. So, I I still will say that they're not important as as important as they were in the past. But there is a different kind of use for the jacket, and well, people don't throw the jackets away. And uh, plus the fact that authors want to have something to be proud of. As you said, right. Most author, authors have those silly pictures on the back or on the flap. I've done over 190 books, and I've never used my photograph once. You don't like your photograph? I just think it's a bit of hubris that's not necessary. I don't do. you don't you think the reader wants to look? It's funny you should say that. Just yesterday, I was listening to this podcast on uh, on Nixon and Watergate. Oh, no, it was, sorry, it wasn't on that. It was Stonewall, the uh, nightclub. Right. And listening to both of the, uh, the hosts and thinking, I really want to see what they look like. Yeah, and they'll tell you to go to the website and take a look. I just have, I have my own quirky little, quirky little quirks. Okay. And one of them is... I said I would never put my own book, my own picture on a book jacket. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing your quirks with us uh, today. It's been a great pleasure. My pleasure. Stephen Heller, how would you like to be uh, extrod? Extrod. Stephen Heller is uh, an author of over 190 books and uh, continues to love book covers and jackets. Thanks again. Thank you.